the world looks to California to answer the hard questions for redemption, to introduce the unfamiliar, to be resilient. Because California bounces back, holds us accountable, values who we are, remains vigilant, defies those in our way, and stands for community. Here on the West Coast, we're at the center of it all. Los Angeles Times, the state of what's next.
evening, I'm Donna Wares, and welcome to the LA Times Book Club. This month, we've all been reading and talking about Stephanie Land's memoir, Made. It's about her life as a single mother who flees an abusive relationship and barely scrapes by by working as a house cleaner. It's a story of poverty. My daughter will learn to walk in a homeless shelter, she writes in the book's opening line. It's also a story about how writing saved her life. Land found solace and success chronicling her daily struggles. She began writing Maid at her kitchen table in Missoula. Her book shows readers the day-to-day -day life of a low-wage worker dealing with the crushing weight of poverty and what she calls a broken system of government assistance. Former President Barack Obama included Maid on his summer reading list. And she said, he says the book provides an unflinching look at America's class divide and a reminder of the dignity of all work. Made also inspired the popular 10 part Netflix series starring Margaret Qualley and her real life mom, Andy McDowell. Since October, Made has become the streaming platform's most watched limited series. This, this evening, Stephanie Lan will be in conversation with my colleague, Paloma Esquivel. And now, Please join me in welcoming them both to the LA Times Book Club's virtual stage. Hi guys, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Stephanie, <laughs> um, how, how's everything going in Missoula? Here in LA, we've had um, a surge in COVID cases and a lot of events canceled. Um, how, how is life treating you uh, in Montana? Pretty good, actually. Um, the the weather has been snowy and rainy and uh kind of weird but um we've we've been okay we had a positive covid case in our family and we're just uh coming out of isolation and my husband is actually sick today and i'm hoping that we're not about to go through that again well, we're delighted to have you with us this month, and uh, we've had such an amazing outpouring of readers who have read the book and, and really connected with it, and um, we've really um, had uh, just a, an amazing amount of people who signed up to join us tonight, so looking forward to your conversation. And I'm also uh, delighted that Paloma is here. This is her first time with the book club. Uh, Paloma um, writes about education and um, investigations and all kinds of amazing things at the time, and, and I was just wondering if Paloma, could you just tell us a little bit about what you're focused on right now? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, my, my experience probably parallels the experience of a lot of educators that sort of started out the school year wanting to really focus on the question of academic recovery and, and you know, how is it that students are catching up after, after the year of closures and, and um, so really looking at, at the ways that schools are trying to catch students up, but a lot of that has honestly been upended by um, the fact that we sort of continue to, to live in this moment of, of not quite stability in schools. You know, like Stephanie mentioned, you know, if there's a positive case, the whole family goes into isolation and kids get pulled out of school and there's teacher shortages, there's tons of absences in schools. So, you know, it's, it's I'm, I'm just sort of going along with <laughs> With what's going on in the schools, which is 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 not quite stable yet, but but it's it's a fascinating time to be an education reporter. Um, we've heard from a lot of readers, and if anyone still has questions, uh, you can share them this evening on the platform where you're watching uh, uh, to L at LA Times. Uh, on Twitter um, or the other platforms, and you also could send us an email to bookclub at latimes.com. Um, I'm going to step away for a bit and um, turn the conversation over to Paloma, and then I'll, I'll rejoin you in a little bit. Thank you both. Thank you. So thank you again, Stephanie. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Um, it was just a really, just, I think, heartbreaking, but, but also uplifting experience reading the book. So. So thank you for taking the time to, to talk to us. I wanted to start right. off with. Oh, I was just going to say, it's such an honor to, to be here. And, and I, I mean, Jane Goodall is going to be <laughs> the author next month. And it's, uh, yeah, it's quite an honor to be here. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Um, 
I wanted to start off with writing and you know this isn't a book about writing but writing is sort of a, a constant presence in the book and, and particularly your desire to be a writer which you 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 say that for as long as you could remember you always wanted to be a writer um you wrote growing up i wrote stories and disappeared with books like they were old friends some of my favorite days off were the rainy ones where i'd start a new book in the morning at a coffee shop finishing it late that evening in a bar um could you just tell us a little bit more about that? What, what made you want to write from such a young age? And what were some of the themes that you were exploring in your writing prior to the time period that's chronicled in Made? Well, um, my want to be a writer actually started when I was in the fourth grade. And I recently reconnected with my teacher that year. His name's Mr. Birdsall. Um, he's in the acknowledgments page of... Uh, of the book and and someone reached out to him he lives in like some remote place in Alaska and doesn't have a lot of internet service and um but I I, I talked to him the other day and I asked him um what made you require fourth grade students to keep a journal and, and mm -hmm. to write so much because so much of that year was about writing. And, and he said, you know, I had just taken this class and, you know, whatever over the summer, but I just, I saw it as a way for you to learn you, a collective you of students um, to learn how to express yourselves and to learn how to talk about your feelings and, um, that is exactly what it was for me. I, I remember um, being really frustrated with the assignments that he gave in fourth grade <laughs> uh, and, and just saying like, I don't know what to write about. And because I'm going through all of these arguments with my friends and, you know, fourth grade drama, I guess. Uh, and, and he said, well, write about that. Write about like what you're going through uh, because that's important. And that, moment like I, I remember it so distinctly and it 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 changed my life and I have known that I wanted to be a writer since then oh that's so cool I love that I love the way that our teachers like even at that age you know they they stick with you and they make they can make such an impact um they're like I like I mentioned sort of early on there's this, this is a book with a lot of heartbreak, a lot of pain. Um, you're trying to survive as a low wage worker. You have a child, you know, and at the same time you're living with this, this constant threat that's sort of um, a constant presence in the book of, of your ex trying to possibly, you know, do something to, that would harm your child or that would take away your child. Um, but, I think what I found really, really lovely was also these moments that you find of, of like light in the story, you know, these moments where you like chase your child around the apartment, you know, to, to tickle her or the moment where your friend came through, I think it was with some, some dishes for your new apartment, right? Like you see these moments of, of where people come through or where you just find moments of light. And I think that like part of that also is, is, is the writing, the way you keep like, you keep sort of finding different ways to write. Um, one of the things that I uh, that you wrote is I started a writing exercise whenever Mia uh, took a bath or was otherwise preoccupied. Ten minutes of constant typing of whatever was on my mind. Sometimes I wrote in the morning, on weekends, and the paragraphs were, were full of good weather, plans to enjoy it, or a secret spot I felt excited to share with my daughter. Other times I wrote after Mia was asleep, after an exhausting day of her fighting me through every transition and turn. Um, first, I just found it amazing that you even had the energy <laughs> to do that. Um, you also were keeping a blog at the time, right? Could you tell us a little bit more just about what about those those things that you kept writing during that time period and and, you know, what, what were you writing about and why was it so important for you to, to kind of keep those, those moments of writing going? Well, um, I mean, going back to the last question, um, I started keeping a journal 
although then I called it a diary and um, it had like a lock and a little key and like a puffy <laughs> cover with like a dinosaur on it, I think. Um, and so <laughs> I had, um, I had started this habit when I was 10 years old and my whole life has been recorded. Um, it, just sitting behind me in this little cabinet is, is, all of my journals um, that I'm kind of terrified about someone reading um, after I die, honestly. <laughs> it's, it's all about boys. It's um, <laughs> it's just all about um, not necessarily uh, things that I was going through that were important. It was, you know, I love Jacob or I love Steve or, you know, <laughs> all these things. Um, but it it became my way of breathing. It became a way of processing. Um, I'm a very introverted, shy person in real life. And it became um, my friend. And I have scoliosis and um, uh, pretty severe scoliosis. And so at one point, my spine decided to curve in a way that I it pinched nerves that went down my right arm and I can't really hold a pen very well. Um, I can't write by hand like I used to. So um, when that happened, I had kind of lost this way of processing things. And my friend introduced me to live journal um, and, you know, Longtime users of the internet will remember Live Journal, uh, and so I started a Live Journal, and then I transferred that to a WordPress site, and um, just started writing things uh, in, I guess, a blog format. Blogs were pretty big at that time; it was like uh, 2010 or so. Um, and every once in a while, I would write th something that. I thought was really beautiful. And so I would post it on Facebook or, or, you know, um, share it with people and they would comment on it. And it, it, um, it was, it was a way to talk about my life. Um, and, but it was also a way to remember things for me. Um, I am not good about baby books. I am not good about like you know, recording things in a scrapbook method, but like I was really good about recording things in a blog format. And, um, and I, I really needed to do that because our days were so packed with driving and going to work and coming home. And then weekends were just like, what can we find to do <laughs> that doesn't cost any money? And it, and so I wanted to record that and I wanted a memory of that. And I wanted to know that our life had these really, really beautiful moments in them. Um, and so that, that was kind of my purpose. And then um, it just grew into a book, I guess. I, 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 I didn't expect it to, although I guess as a writer, you always expect things to turn into a book, but I, I didn't, I didn't think it would. And, and it's been so incredible to have, um, that record of our lives together in, in those, in those days. Did you, I think you said in, in that, when you were writing about some of these things that you were jotting down that it would, you sort of imagined it as a, your kind of baby book for, uh, for a story who's referred to as, as me and the book. Um, did you, did you give them those writings? Have they been able to see them? Of the blog itself? No. Uh, the blog, like I, I copy pasted it <laughs> at one point, um, like months before, I got a book deal like six months before I was a freelance writer and, and trying to come up with like what kind of book I would write. And so I like copy pasted all of my blog entries into a word document. And I think it was like 150,000 words, of this, like, this whole nonsense. And, and so no, but I, I have actually thought about, um, 
going back into the archives and, and printing out stuff for them. Um, because so much of my blog was a lot of pictures and, and just mm. remembering these just really precious, beautiful moments that we had together. And so, yeah, I hope they're not watching right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Trying, someday maybe ruin, like yeah when they're eight well, like when they're 18 and going off to college like I'm in this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or have gone off to college and you have time to to do things like that I'm sure yes yes that's that's the key probably <laughs> <laughs> um I want to ask you about the the tv show so the, um made was adapted into a net Netflix series, which premiered in the fall of last year and has been incredibly, incredibly popular. Um, how did that, how did the popularity of the show change um, the way, I guess, the things people ask you about the story? Did, did it change um, sort of people's, you know, reaction and interaction with, with the story? Um, I get a lot of questions usually it's on Instagram um, from people who have only watched the series and not read the book. Uh, and they ask about Regina and they ask about like, why didn't you go back to Nate? Um, they're very upset that I didn't stay with Nate. Um, but those are both fictional characters. And um, uh, my mom in the series is a very fictional character. And, and so I, I even had an interview yesterday where, you know, it started out and she said, oh, I expected you to look like Alex in, in the series. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, you know, I, I tried to prepare myself for a bit of an identity crisis, mm -hmm. um, with the series. Um, I, I had a bit of that when the book came out because suddenly I was only the character in my book. And I, I wasn't me who I am now or who I was three years ago. Um, but now it seems a little bit more intense. Um, people are very curious about the plot lines and the characters in the series and want to know what happened to them, want to know, like, did I keep in touch with my mom, my dad, you know? Um, and so I think that part of it has just been a little bit frustrating um, because that means they obviously didn't read the book. <laughs> and so it's like, well, you should read the book and all of those questions will be answered. Um, and so I, I have, I've been dealing with that um, quite a bit, which I mean, I, I don't want to complain about it. It's, it's, it's great and it's wonderful that my book has been inspiring for this Netflix series and I'm flabbergasted that it was. And, and I am grateful for the relationships that I have with Molly smith Nutzler, who was the showrunner and Margaret Qualley, who um, played me in the series. And um, it, it's been, um, it's been an amazing ride. Um, but at the same time, it kind of has been frustrating in the point where, um, a lot of my book was about invisibility and, and, um, feeling like I was not really there in the house that I was cleaning and that I was not really there in my life. Um, and so the series, I think, has kind of um, triggered that a little bit of, of just feeling like I'm not really there anymore. It's, um, mm. it's the series. It's not necessarily my story. Um, and, and, and I don't really feel like I could complain about that. I don't really feel like I can say this sucks because mm. who do you know has a Netflix series inspired by their book? I mean, it's just, it doesn't happen. And so I have this 
resounding crowd around me saying like, oh my God, you should be so grateful. And I am, but at the same time, um, there's, there's been a lot, um, there's been a lot. (laughs) It just, I don't know how else to describe it. It's just been, um, it's, it's been intense really. Yeah. Um, you told when, um, in an interview with my colleague, Margaret uh, Walkler for, uh, in advance of this conversation, you talked about watching the series with, with story, right? Um, what was that like? Had, had they read the book? Had, or um, how much of this story did, did they know? Or what was it like watching this fictionalized version of, of your life with, with your child? Um, so story is now 14 and a half. And um, right before the pandemic started, we went down to LA and we met with all the writers and had this like wonderful vacation, really. Uh, thank you, John Wells. Um, and we stayed in this hotel and had like room service and, um, and, and it was fantastic. Um, and, and that was kind of, um, the final part of me telling them, you know, as much as they wanted to know about my life at that time. And, and I loved that they wanted to meet story and that they wanted us there um, story did read the book. Um, they read it. Um, they started reading it, I think like three or four months before it came out, or maybe after that, I don't really remember. Um, I had them read the chapter where they get their ear, um, tubes put in at first. Mm. And, um, And then after that, I gave them a signed copy of the hardback and and said, you know, read it when when you're able to. And it took them about a year. Um, And for a person who usually goes through books in about three days, um, that was a long time for them. Um, They said that they, they needed time to process a lot of the stuff. I don't know if they ever felt, um, I don't think they ever felt embarrassed. I was really careful to not write anything that might be embarrassing for them. And um, so I was pretty grateful of that. But at the same time, I'm, you know, I can only write my story and my story was very much involved in parenting them. Um, and what I went through with um, being a single mom and they were my kid. And so um, as a parent, I, I didn't want to um, affect their life as much. Um, I, I just, I didn't want to inhibit their relationship with their dad. I didn't want the series to do that. I, um, I very much wanted them to still have some kind of normal life. And, mm-hmm. um, but I do, they were, they were very affected by the book. Um, they, especially the car accident scene, um, mm-hmm. and, and some other points of just not really realizing, um, how tough it was on me. And I didn't really want that to be the point. Um, I wanted it to be like, Oh, I love you so much. I'll do anything for you. But, um, and then when we watched the series, um, we did it on my laptop in my bed, like under covers. And we watched the first two episodes. We actually watched the second episode first by accident. (laughs) And (laughs) it was just kind of like, well, that's kind of weird. <laughs> they're, they're flashing back to all this stuff. Okay. Um, and then we watched it the way you're supposed to watch it. Um, and, <laughs> but so two things came out um, from those first two episodes was um, one was story turned to me and said, we made it out, but so many others didn't. And 
another thing they said was, was my dad really like that? Mm -hmm. And I had to say yes. Um, Mm -hmm. Because the series, you know, it's, it's inspired by the book. um, But there are a lot of things they got really, really right. And Mm -hmm. one of the things was the Nick Robinson character and where he lives and what he does and who he is, what he looks like. And, um, and it was so triggering for me. Um, and then for a story to watch that too, it, it was, it, it was really hard for them. And, and we had a lot of conversations about it. Uh, they also very much missed Port Townsend. And um, I'm yeah. hoping we have a trip to plan there at the end of April. Um, I have a speaking gig in, in the Port Townsend area. So we're going to go there. Um, and I think that's always going to be a special place for them. Um, the series, I mean, has also, I imagined, sparked a lot of great conversation, important conversation, right, around uh, the issues of low-wage workers, uh, around issues of poverty, around issues of, of how, how we treat workers um has has that been has that been a good conversation uh sparked by by the series and the popularity of the series um it it started coming out in book tour um Mm -hmm. i would get questions like why were you a maid and i didn't really understand that (laughs) at first and then i realized uh, why are you a white person, mm-hmm. a maid? And um, and so I I started to see a lot of the attachment to the story because it is a white person who is struggling with things and struggling with being poor and struggling with government assistance. And we don't really hear those stories, but I mean... I joke about it and, and, and I say, you know, the more white people who are affected by things, the more people will listen. And, and I really felt that when the book was um, published and, Mm -hmm. and I saw that as an opportunity um, again, as a very introverted, shy person, um, as an opportunity to speak out and, and be an advocate. Um, I, I had many moments um, with mentors and people who I, I reached out to because it, honestly, I was terrified, um, at my book's popularity. I, I really didn't expect that. And, um, I, I saw that, um, this podium was presenting itself. And, um, and so I have done my best to talk about racism as much as possible and and talk about how low-wage workers are a population of people that we expect or we feel entitled to serve us. And that's been very evident in the pandemic. And that has been um, heartbreaking to me personally. because I, I just, I just know that low wage is often um, part of a, a class of people who are usually black and brown, and 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 that work makes all other work possible, and and we kind of expect that work to happen, um, and. And so I, I don't know, I just, I've tried to talk about that as much as possible and, and just try and open people's eyes that the reason why you're listening to me is because I am a very likable poor person. I am a success story. I'm like what you call rags to riches. You know, this is, um, this is a story that Americans have grown to love. Um, and, and we absolutely need to be listening to stories that are way more marginalized than mine 
And we need to listen to it angry people we need to listen to people who are still in that situation we need to listen to black and brown people we need to listen to people in our communities you know it's we don't need to listen to some author who got a big book deal and you know wrote about this job that is done by um the majority of black and brown citizens and and so i i just i try to talk to that or speak to that as much as possible. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think we definitely felt that very strongly. And we felt that over the last two years. I mean, it's always sort of been evident, right? The things we expect of low wage workers and and black and brown workers. But over the past two years, seeing the way that those those expectations, you know, that, that certain groups need to continue working and the rest of us get to work from home. And, you know, and, and it doesn't matter that lives are on the line. It's, it's, it's just been a, a very, very, very telling about our society, but a uh, very devastating thing to, to watch play out. Um, going back to, to the story a little bit, when, when made ends, you've arrived in Montana, this place that you've been dreaming of being in for, for many, many years and that you're still in now, uh, that you're speaking to us now from. Um, can, you, can you update us a little bit on, on what happened in the years after? Um, did, you, did you continue working as a domestic worker um, after you arrived in Montana? I did, actually. Um, I, I ended the book at a kind of a literal high note because uh, mm-hmm. we're on the top of a mountain. Um, but the years after that, I mean, that was 2012. Um, and it was two years before I graduated college and I worked as a house cleaner. Um, it's much of what my next book is about. Uh, honestly, just uh, it's called class and it focuses on uh going through college as a low income student and, and how many barriers are put in place uh, for students who are trying to access higher education and especially a degree in higher education. And, and I experienced that I, I was kicked off of food stamps because my kid was over six years old and I couldn't work 20 hours a week as a full-time student. And, um, and it was, Honestly, um, it was until I got the book deal that I felt like I was out of poverty. So, I mean, I had, I had written enough as a freelancer, um, and made enough income that I was off food stamps before then. Um, but we were still in low income housing. Um, my kids were still on Medicaid. We were still, you know, on a lot of government assistance programs, um, I could not afford any type of medical care or, you know, anything. Um, and before I got that uh, check for the book advance, I, there was about three weeks that um, I didn't have any money. I mean, I, I there was a check that was late for freelancing, um, which many freelancers can probably appreciate. <laughs> I'm just like, what? This $850 check is not here. And and it was like it was gonna pay for everything that month and it didn't come. And and so I was writing checks for pizza and back when you could do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like um uh, and and bouncing checks and and that was the only food that I ate. And so um the book deal for me was what got me out of poverty. And, Mm -hmm. and I have a really hard time with, um, people making the assumption that, you know, I, I went from welfare to work or I, I wrote myself out of poverty or anything like that, or I'm the, you know, again, the success story. I, it wasn't that at all. It, It was that I got a book deal. Um, and, and it's a book deal that I, I, have a handful of friends who I've known who have experienced. And, um, and so I, um, yeah, I, I, I continued 
trying to live in that life of having this advance money. And um, it, it seemed like it had come so quickly and it would disappear as quickly. And, and I didn't trust it. And, um, and so it was, it was weird. Um, but yeah, I, I wrote the book at a kitchen table in low income housing and I, I kind of envy myself (laughs) during that time because now I have like this house and a like she shed in the yard and I'm still like just totally blocked. (laughs) Um, you have, that's your, your writing shed that you're talking to us from. It is, it is my she shed. (laughs) Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I got this idea because, um, we moved into this house at the start of a pandemic. We were very lucky. My realtor like knew somebody at the time houses were getting like 40 to 50 offers before they even went on the market. And it was just horrible, um, my landlord kind of kicked us out <laughs> and said, like, we're going to sell the house and we don't want to sell it to you. Mm-hmm. And so we suddenly had to move with, you know, several dogs and several kids, which is not really renter friendly. Um, and so we found this place and I was here for, um, about a year and a half. And then finally I just kind of put my foot down and said, I need a shed. (laughs) I need like an office. I need like space to just go sit and look out the window or stare at a wall or, you know, sit in a comfy couch or sit in a comfy chair, which is behind me there. And, um, and, and just process things. Um, so much of writing is, is thinking, um, and allowing the space to think and coming up with that first sentence and coming up with that first scene. And I didn't have space to think at all. So this is gratefully my space. That's wonderful. Um, have you had an opportunity to talk with a lot of other, either after the publication of the book or, or following the series, uh, to talk with other domestic workers about your story? And, and what do you hear from, from them when you have those conversations? I did, actually, um, after the book was published, I, um, I received a lot of emails from domestic workers, um, a lot of single moms who were cleaning houses, um, uh, a few of them would uh, send me photos of their cleaning buckets and, mm-hmm. and, and they said, um, I'm still cleaning, but I'm putting my kid through college. And a lot of people um, messaged me and said that their mom or their grandma, I, I just got one a few minutes, like before we went on, um, that they that they're, you know, it it was a generational um, thing to be a domestic worker and and their lives have been different because of the work that their mother or grandmother did. And so, yeah, I, I, I have heard, um, I've heard from a lot of them and, and just, you know, talking to agent Poo from, um, the domestic Mm -hmm. workers Alliance and, um, and working with them, um, and being in touch with the domestic workers Alliance, uh, or they, they're doing a bill in Congress, um, for their, I forget what it's called right now. Um, but, they're they're doing a bill that will give them um, some benefits as far as um, being safe and being taken care of. Um, they also have the My Elia um, website that allows you to donate to um, for your personal domestic worker 
um, you can give them um, money towards a sick day or or anything like that. And and they're doing a lot of really important work. And I've been really happy to um, be involved in all of that. I didn't know about that website. What is it? It's called My Alia. It's um, so M Y A L I A dot com. And so you can go there. And um, so if you have a domestic worker, you can, I think, register the person that has, or they can set up a profile. Um, and then you can donate hours or donate money, basically, so that they can um, have money to draw off of if they need to take a sick day, basically. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Um, do you want to tell us more? I don't want to put more pressure on you, but do you want to tell us more about your, your, your next book? Do you want to tell us more about class? Oh my God. Um, I'm pretty excited about class. I mean, I, I wrote this, I'm looking at, like I printed out like all versions of my essay and, um, I, I wrote about, um, my time as a single mother, senior year of college, I was pregnant and, um, had a kid in kindergarten and single mom, um, totally completely on my own. And I wrote this essay, um, for the New York review of books called, I think they titled it, um, a portrait of an artist as a single mom. And, and it was really about, um, not only going to college, but deciding to be an artist. And, you know, I, I really didn't feel like I could afford that as a single mom. I felt like I needed to do some kind of business degree or some kind of, um, I don't know, to be a contributing member of society. That was always my big thing. And, and I didn't really think that an English degree would do that. And I didn't really think being a writer would do that. And it was, it became this thing that I just absolutely had to do. Mm. Um, otherwise, I, I don't know if I would have been happy, really. I mean, you, I don't know, parenting and, and, and being a parent is just such a suck. <laughs> of like of yourself and and just who you are and and it is this like relinquishing and it's just this like oh it's it's so beautiful but it's also so horrible I mean I have friends who had babies and and they're about to turn one and they're writers and it's just um and so I I just I really really needed to be a writer and I, I needed to be a mother and a writer at the same time. And, and I took a leap and did that. And, um, and so the book is really about, not only about my senior year of college, but about stories, um, first year of kindergarten. Um, you know, I, I, I talk a lot about in the book about all of the barriers that low wage people face in trying to get a college degree. But then I saw it happening with story when they were in kindergarten and it broke my heart and, and just, um, and so there's a lot of contrast um, or maybe not contrast. There's a lot of like back and forth um, between my experience and their experience and, and just, talking about um how higher education is just such an elite system and and mm -hmm. it's set up for people who are wealthy basically I think in my opinion yeah that's another thing we've seen really clearly during the pandemic right is the way in which so many people have had to leave that that um you know abandon their attempts for now at least of, of of doing higher education because because of all of the challenges of the pandemic and and um and the way that that has impacted certain populations more than others is it's just it 
pretty clear and pretty devastating. As yeah. Well. Well, I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, we saw all of the college students who were evicted from their housing, um, you know, because colleges suddenly went to virtual um, classes. They they kicked out all of these students from their dorms. So mm -hmm. they lost their their work, you know, uh, and and just it, it, that made me so mad. And, mm -hmm. and nobody was really talking about it. And then the unemployment benefits kicked in and the, the expanded unemployment uh, benefits kicked in and people started going back to school. Um, there were a lot of stories in the media about like um, single parents who were able to afford to take some time off to go back to school in you know, whatever online classes they could do. But at the same time, I mean, I, I'm still thinking about these students who, <laughs> who were basically evicted from their universities and they can't return. And, and, and nobody really talked about that. I mean, I think there was like two articles um, and there are so many college students who are hungry and, and suddenly it was just a non-issue, I guess it, it just, <laughs> Um, I, I don't know. I, I can't really watch the news as much, um, because it just makes me so mad. It also makes me mad that people aren't talking about the things that really matter. And, mm. and that makes me really, really mad. <laughs> like, mm. I don't want to see his face, like the past president's face. Like, I don't, I I just, I want to hear about the people who are being evicted. I want to hear mm. about kids who are going hungry. Um, I want to hear about people who are, who are really struggling and yet we're, you know, so focused on certain things in this country that, that don't really matter for a lot of people who are living lives that, that it is just, it's just struggle. It's day to day. And, you know, I, I, we just went through a, a positive COVID thing in our household and we had to isolate and we had to pull our kids from school. And, um, I just think about what parents were able to do that if they had to work in order to pay the rent. And so I think about like my 14 year old probably would have been a babysitter for my seven year old um, for that entire week. I think about like the kids that would have been left at home. I think about, you know, all of these impossible choices that people are faced with. And that doesn't really seem to be talked about that much right now. Um, and it frustrates me and frustrates me with, with college too. And so. I just kind of went off on a tangent. <laughs> Sorry. An, an important, no, an important tangent. And I mean, sort of along those lines, actually, I was, I was going to ask there, you know, I think um, last month you were involved in, in um, a petition around the, the child tax uh, credit. Am I right? Um, for you, like, what are some of the policy changes that, that you think would make the biggest difference um, right now for domestic workers, for single mothers um, living in poverty? Oh my goodness. I mean, first of all, we need to remove work requirements. There are so many work requirements involved in um, having food stamps, Medicaid, um, childcare. Um, a lot of my experience in being government assistance was just proving that I was working and mm -hmm my worth as a human being revolved around how many hours that I was actually physically working. And, and that stuck with me for a really long time. Um, and, and it's still there. I mean, it's still, even with the child tax credit, you have, you know, a mansion who is trying to enforce a work requirement to receive a child tax credit, um, which has proven to help so many families um, and, and lift so many children out of poverty. And 
And I, I think the sooner that we get to some kind of universal basic income um, and just give the working poor, um, whether they have children or not, honestly, I, 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 I think we should have a universal basic income. We should have a universal child care. We should have universal health care for at least kids. I mean, I, I don't understand how we're not willing to take care of the children in our country and, and the people who take care of our children. And, and a lot of that is just um, not trusting poor people with cash. Um, when really they need cash, they, they need money because they're not being paid enough to survive. And they're, they don't have benefits. They don't have sick days. They don't have savings. They don't have any of that. And I, I think a lot of people forget that. Um, I think the narrative that was set up in the eighties, you know, with Reagan um, about the poor being lazy and, and not wanting to work and taking advantage. I think that is still very prevalent today. And, and, and it's, it's awful. It, it's pe people don't not, People don't not want to work. Is that <laughs> <That's> like a <laughs> double negative? <laughs> um, but they they want to work absolutely, and and they want to provide for their families. But it's impossible to work when you have jobs that don't pay enough, and they have um, schedules that don't necessarily work with daycare. They have schedules that. Um, uh, counteract with each other it's it's really hard and then you're making you know seven eight bucks an hour or nine or you know ten if you're lucky and, and that's not enough it's just not enough well thank you I just want really really want to say thank you for your openness in this conversation um I just really really appreciate it um, and I know we have some questions from, from the audience. I'm going to hand things over to, to Donna to kind of uh, share some of those questions. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we've been hearing from readers. And actually, one of the um, um, people you seem to um, share most on social media lately is, uh, is Keats. Where is he this evening? <laughs> Uh, Keats. So um, Keats is a dog I bought. Oh, there he is. Um, <laughs> I bought a dog and I flew him in from Florida. Um, I decided to get this huge puppy um, because I had, I had four pregnancy losses in a year. And, um, and at the end of the fourth one, I told my husband to get a vasectomy <laughs> and I said, you need to get a vasectomy. And then we're getting this huge puppy. And so I thought um, the huge puppy would help me um, stop buying baby clothes and it worked. And so now we have this dog that is the size of a pony. <laughs> uh, he is in the house. I told everybody to bring the dogs into the house because they tend to bark and well Keats will tend to um when I'm out here he'll sit outside the door and start whining so uh I'm sure he's getting lots of treats and you know whatever in the house right now but yes he is he's a very large dog he's a um half St. Bernard and half Bernese mountain dog it's called a St. Bernese um I did not expect him to get this big but here we are <laughs> Yeah, those pictures are amazing, and I was just enjoying them on your feed, so I, I had to ask. Um, our first uh, reader question, actual reader question, uh, comes from Vanessa. Um, we've been talking about writing um, this evening, and she said, I'd love to hear a bit more about your writing process, how it has evolved over the years, as well as uh, how did you manage to keep writing through the pandemic? What's your secret? I'm not 
not writing through the pandemic at all. Um, <laughs> so I guess I will say that. Um, my writing process actually is I will think through something almost completely. Um, I will think through, you know, the the story arc, the the points that I want to make, the scenes that I'm touching on. It it happened with the book. Um made I, I wrote from start to finish in one word doc. I did not look back. Like I started like I knew how many um <laughs> I knew what my word count was at the beginning and the end, and I just kept a tally and I I wrote it straight through. I I wouldn't recommend doing that, honestly, because it requires a lot of editing. Um, And so now that I am trying to think out how I'm going to write this next book, it has just all been um, thinking about scenes that really stick out um, thinking about scenes that honestly made me cry, <laughs> thinking about scenes that I can literally place myself in and so that I can sit in um, and know exactly what it smelled like, exactly what it looked like, exactly what it felt like. I, I know what my skin felt like in that moment. Um, and so those are the moments that I expand on, um, it, whether it's an essay or a book, I, I still don't know how to write a book. I just kind of did. <laughs> so I, I am, I am trying to do that again. And I'm, and I'm remembering, um, that I, I'm an essay writer, <laughs> not necessarily a book writer. Do you have a publication date when we can expect to see class? No, I mean, my deadline was like this month. Um, so yeah, um, hopefully soon. <laughs> our, our next question comes from uh, Margo and she's uh, a business writer who covers the, uh, the economy at the Times, Margo Roosevelt. And she is built on something you've already talked about, but I, uh, she went, she had a specific question about looking back what policies or laws might have helped you um, in, in the time you know when you were going through your most need? Is it higher minimum wage, more funding for shelters, fewer corporate and um, tax breaks for wealthy individuals to pay for services? Uh, do you have a specific uh, things that wish list that that you think would help others? Absolutely, um, I think there's a lot of um, it's called means testing. When people decide to seek out government assistance, um, means testing is um, a, a packet of paperwork that you need to fill out that you're asked if um, if you have burial plots, if you have property, if you have um, jewelry in your house that is worth something, if you have a car that um, might be over a few thousand dollars. Um, Most of the time when you, for most states, um, when you apply for government assistance, you're not allowed to have more than $3,000 worth of assets and that includes your car. And so how are you supposed to save up for anything? Uh, Anything that would better your life. And so many times I, I felt like, anything that I did that would better our life, I was punished for. And that included um, getting an education or, or working for myself, um, being an unemployed person um, or being a self-employed person. I wasn't unemployed. I was self-employed. Um, and and it, it felt like they didn't really agree with that decision because I didn't have a pay stub. I had to, uh, I, I carried around this folder full of letters from clients who um, gave statements saying that I worked in their house at these times. I, I had to make copies of all of the checks that they paid me. It was just, it's so much just proving 
that you're actually working and and that's backwards to me that is so backwards i i think you know if if someone is hungry we should just give them food if someone needs child care we should just give them child care i mean why is why is that so hard and and for some reason we force people we force poor people to prove that they're worthy in some way because they're working and that is just backwards for me. Thank you, Stephanie. Our next question comes from Paula and she would like to know, how did you decide which houses to feature in the book? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I've never been asked that before. I, I love questions like that. Um, I, you know, I, there, there was a house that was cut from the book that I was kind of sad about. Um, but I think, you know, any, well, it was just any book or any house that, um, became part of the story in the book. And so, it was really just a stylistic thing and, and wanting to keep with the arc and um, like, you know, the plant house kept with this moment that I had about being sick. Um, Henry's house came about, you know, because of certain events that happened at the time. Um, I called her Rose in the book um, and, and just, I just, in looking through that time, I remembered scenes that, um, I don't know, furthered the narrative. And that's kind of boring to talk about, but at the same time, it was just kind of, um, so what things did I experience that pushed me in some way or changed me in some way? Uh, there are a lot of houses that didn't make it in the book. And um, I'm kind of glad that they didn't because I can, I can joke about them in my own way <laughs> and, and just enjoy that they didn't make it in the, in the book. Well, Paula was a big fan of the book and she actually had quite a long list of questions, uh, but here's another one. We'll just do one of her other short questions. And she asked, did you ever consider turning to churches for support? Was that ever help? Um, I did turn to churches to support. Um, there is a number that you can call um, called 211 for help. Um, and, and I called that number many times, um, especially when I got to Missoula and there just weren't a lot of services here, especially for housing. And I needed to find a house. Um, uh, right after my second daughter was born um, and our housing situation was not great. And so I needed um, to find housing. And so I called that number um, every couple of weeks and it was like, um, it was like an, I don't know, I'm an atheist, but it was like an angel on the line. I mean, they just knew all of the resources um, available. They knew who had funding. Um, and a lot of that was about housing and, and, and who had the available places that I can go to. Um, and so I, I relied on that. And one time I called and I said I needed money for childcare. I need I needed help with childcare. And um childcare resources had denied me because I made a hundred dollars more than um than their limit. And so I was denied childcare because I made a hundred dollars more. And <laughs> and she said start calling the churches, start with the Catholics. <laughs> and, and so I, I did that. I, I called all the churches and um, I got, I think like three or 400 bucks from a church. Um, and then another friend of mine 
um, went to a church and they did a collection for me that um, paid my student, my, I had a private student loan through Alaska and they paid that bill for two months. And without that, I don't think I would have, I, I probably would have been homeless um, at that time with um, Story who had just turned seven and Coraline who was only a couple of months old. So um, very grateful to those organizations and those people who who do that. So you lived in during this uh, period, you lived in two different states, uh, Montana, and then you were originally um, were in Washington state. Was there a big difference between the two states or, or not much in terms of finding? There's assistance? absolutely a difference. I mean, so Washington is very wet. <laughs> it rains a lot there. Um, we had really bad allergies. There's also something called the Seattle freeze, which is um, that people in Seattle tend to be a little cold um, towards strangers. Um, and I experienced that very much. I, I couldn't make friends there and it was really hard. Um, and, and just once I moved to Missoula, it was just, the people are nice here or they were 10 years ago um they still are but we're just all kind of traumatized by the gentrification I think and all the the Botox bars downtown and <laughs> it's um uh, it's been a it's been a crazy last few years in Missoula with the pandemic because so many people are moving here um but yeah, there, there was a lot of difference between Washington and Montana and mostly the drier climate. Um, we had a lot of allergies in Washington um, with dust mites and, um, you know, there's fleas and there's like all these things. And then once we got to Montana, um, we didn't have a lot of the allergies that we had in, Missoula, or in Washington. And, and so that was a huge deal. Well, I have one more reader uh, question. We we did have quite a few questions about the Netflix series. Everyone's very interested in that, and and you've already discussed that. So I I won't share a lot of questions, but we do have one from a reader, uh, Lucia, Lucia, and she would like to know um, what was your role in the series? Did you were you involved in um, in any way in the production in getting it together? And her second question is: Were you in agreement overall? with the way that you and your family were portrayed? So um, I, I sold the option um, to John Wells and Margot Robbie. Um, it was, I think I talked to about 10 production companies um, and they were the last ones that I spoke to. And they, they talked a lot about uh, fictionalizing my story and bringing in people of color and their experiences. And, and this was the first time that I had actually heard about that from anybody. Um, before that, it was just, they wanted a true adaptation of my book, which, which I was kind of horrified by because I, I thought that, um, I just, I kept imagining the guy who, uh, does a voiceover for movies <laughs> and and he would say like one white woman's dip into poverty and how she got herself out and and just like I was horrified by this um <laughs> by that possibility and I, I really didn't want it to happen but I don't really think in fiction at all and so um when John Wells and Margot Robbie and and Aaron Jontow were on the call um, they presented this whole different thing and, and I, I absolutely loved it. And, um, and then, you know, you, you just, you sell this option and, and you give away, you know, the ability to visually represent your story and, and you hope that it turns out to be the best. And so they sold it to Netflix and, um, it was straight series. It wasn't a pilot and that was a really big deal. Um, and then they went 
for it. And, and, and so I had a weekend with Molly Smith Metzler, who was a showrunner and creator and main writer of the series and Aaron John Tao, who is the vice president of John Wells Productions and um, John Wells himself. And we had this weekend in Port Townsend and uh, the Mount Vernon area where the book is based. Um, Molly calls it the trauma tour (laughs) <laughs> because we um we drove around to like all the places that I lived in they asked me at least 200 questions about like all the most horrible things in my life um especially pertaining to my relationship with my ex um I didn't really give him a lot of space on the page in the book because I didn't think he deserved it um but they were really focused on, or Molly was really focused on um, talking a lot about how emotional abuse affects um, affects victims. And, and that was really important to me. So I told them everything I possibly could. Um, but after that, it was, I didn't really know anything. I I wasn't involved in the script writing. I wasn't involved in the cast or, you know, I mean, Molly would like tell me like, oh, we're like looking at this person and it's like this huge celebrity. And, and she was saying, you know, don't get your hopes up. And, um, and so like, I kind of knew what was going on, but I didn't really, um, when they told me about, the Paula character, uh, I had this reaction of just like, but that's not, that's not true. It didn't happen that way. And, and so I, I kind of, um, I had a moment of just like letting it go. I had many moments of just letting it go and, and trusting them with my story. I, hoped that it would be something that I would respect and that I would like and that I would appreciate and that I would like talking about. Um, but I really didn't know if it was going to be like that until I watched it. And they just, they fucking blew me out of the water. They, they're just, it, the things that they did with my story are so amazing. Um, and the things that they did artistically, um, Molly is, is just phenomenal. Margaret is phenomenal. I mean, I, I, I am just so honored, um, to watch the series. And I, I, I view it as like something that's very separate from my book. Um, I, I don't really it, to me, they're, they're two very different stories and, and artistically they're emotionally the same, but artistically they're, they're their own. I mean, watching Margaret Qualley, like disappear into a couch and go into a hole, <laughs> it's just like that. I don't know. There are just so many scenes in that movie that, um, I just absolutely loved and appreciated and were not any part of my book, really. But I, I guess they were inspired by, and I appreciate that. Well, we're running a little over, but I, I want to just throw in one final question. One of the things that readers regularly reach out to us since we, uh, when the pandemic started, Coming up two years ago, we just thought, well, we'll move the book club virtually for a month or two until we get back to being out in the real world. And of course, since then, um, you know, we've been producing a book club every month and, and readers regularly tell us that it's really been an escape for them, that no matter what's going on, they can come and join our book discussions, uh, read our books and, and be part of it. And, and that the escape part of it um, is just such a big thing. And I'm, I'm just curious, I would like to ask both of you, um, um, if there's a book, um, not maybe the best book you've read during the pandemic, but what is the book uh, that you think of most recently that you've read that was truly an escape for you? And I'm going to start with Paloma. What was your escape? 
Yeah, I mean, oh, I'd, I'd be lying if I said I, I'm doing a ton of reading during the pandemic. It's uh, uh, definitely feel a lot of um, uh, very drained mentally at the end of the day. Um, I think currently right now in our family, we are escaping into the Harry Potter series. So that has been a lovely, lovely thing um, with our kids to, to share with them. And we're doing it in Spanish, which has been uh, a little bit challenging, but but a lot of fun. How about you, Stephanie? I love that. Um, I just started reading The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe with my seven-year-old. And I've been very excited about that because it's like the... Um, the books that I, I read when I was, you know, five or six and I still have them. And, and so I don't think she really notices or recognizes like how special that is, but I've been reading those to her. Um, another book that I read in the pandemic, I, I also didn't read many books. I, I, I have a hard time with attention span. Um, but one of the books that I read that I fucking just loved was um, Lauren Huff's Leaving Isn't the Hardest Thing. It's a book of essays um, about her time in the Air Force and leaving a cult and working as a cable guy. And uh, it was very similar to uh, the book that I wrote, honestly. And and I love Lauren personally and, and just... Um, that book was one that I read in like two days, which um, was not normal in pandemic times. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this uh, conversation. Um, it it really feels like we've only been talking for a few minutes and and we've, we're going an hour and 15 minutes. So um, I did want to mention, uh, you know, for every book club event, we always uh, have an independent book selling partner. Uh, tonight's independent uh, bookstore is Skylight Books. And thank you, Stephanie, for signing uh, book plates for us. So uh, for this event, um, through the Eventbrite page, we have autographed books and um, we've had a lot of readers have, have really been snapping them up. So there's a limited number. I think there's still some left. And I wanted to thank uh, Skylight Books for being our, our partner this evening. I wanted to also give a quick preview of next month. In February, uh, Jane Goodall is joining us. And she's going to talk about her new project. It's called The Book of Hope, A Survival Guide for Trying Times. And ticket information will be coming soon. So um, watch for that. And uh, it's also a good reminder to sign up for the LA Times Book Club newsletter because that's where we share all of our news and we'll keep you up to date on everything we're reading. And we always put um, videos of our previous book club. So uh, this, event, this uh, video from this evening will be there as well. And as we wrap up, I, I'd like to go back to our uh, really amazing guests this evening and just give you, um, each of you, just a chance, any final comments, uh, parting uh, takeaway, or just, just something you'd like to mention to end the evening, um, to go back to something that stuck with you. Uh, Paloma, what's your uh, parting thought this evening? I think I just would want to say thank you again to Stephanie. Just, you know, you you put your story out there on the page um, and then your openness to answer and to, to um, tell us even more about your, your so many of these experiences and um, experiences with your child. Um, and I'm just really, really grateful to you for that. So thank you. Stephanie, anything you'd like to add or, or what you'd like readers to take away from uh, your story? Oh, I, I just echo. Plumas, I mean, thank you so much for having me on here. It's such an honor. I think it hit me like five minutes before I did the mic check or whatever. <laughs> like, oh my God, it's LA Times <laughs> Book Club. Like, this is really happening. Um, and so thank you so much for for choosing my book and my story. And and I really hope that because of that, um, people will listen to, to other people's stories too. 
Well, thank you, Stephanie. It's really been such a pleasure to meet you. And, you know, we try to choose book for our community book club that every month we, we just try to say, this is a subject and a book that we not only should read, but we should all talk about and share. And um, thank you for just sharing all of your insights. And, and thank you, Paloma. Um, it's a, such a pleasure to see you. I don't get to see you at the office. So I occasionally get to see you on Zoom and um, uh, really just amazing. And I want to thank all of our readers uh, who joined us tonight, but who've also sh been sharing. Since we started reading the book, we had a lot of people would just send comments about their own lives and how the book touched them and how the story touched them and why they were glad that we chose this book this month. And then as they watched the series as well, some people came in by the book, others watched the series, and everyone wanted to know how the two were different. So uh, thank you for sharing that this evening. And um, just thanks, everyone. Good night, and uh, we'll see you next month. Bye. Thank you so much.